Okay. Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our session uh, on software ecosystems for trust management, which is organized uh, jointly by two European projects uh, funded under the Next Generation Internet Initiative and uh, on the topic of blockchains. Um, so we have seen the program. We're going to have um, nine uh, interesting uh, topics uh, to be covered uh, that are related both from the viewpoint of technologies and the viewpoint of applications. We have also welcomed to this workshop uh, people or organizations to present that are not directly linked uh, to the projects. So there will be participants from both projects, but, but also some participants that are not directly engaged in the uh, two projects, but they are still uh, working on specific topics that are of interest uh, to our uh, projects. So I will uh, myself and uh, Mirko uh, from the Trubla project are first going to present uh, shortly uh, the two projects, the Onto Chain and the Trubla project. And later on, uh, we will follow uh, the workshop. At the, at the end of the workshop, we have uh, also devoted uh, around 15 minutes for um, any discussions, questions and answers. So let me just uh, go through uh, the um, introduction to the Onto Chain project, which started last year. Uh, and myself, uh, I'm Vlado, uh, who is the technical coordinator of this project. So, um, just uh, as a short introduction, I want to say uh, some personal or share with you some personal experience. Uh, when I was eight years old, I saw, I would say the first um, scientific uh, uh, or scientific fiction movie uh, that is called uh, The Demon Sea. And it was very scary for me as a really horror movie where a computer that uh, was invented by a professor uh, started to be so smart that governed the house of the professor and decided to uh, actually have a child with the professor's wife. So it stopped the entrance uh, gates uh, to, the, to the house and did really uh, very, very um, uh, bad, bad things. So um, today, in 2021, we are uh, talking about uh, software ecosystems for trust management. And we are definitely um, in front of us, we have many uh, upcoming use cases that involve uh, our trust in the systems that we build. For example, uh, shell the door to our home automatically open to an unexpected visitor? Or should I borrow my car to my neighbor? Or uh, what's the quality of the apple I'm about to eat? And things like that. So there are many um, trust critical use cases that our software, the software that we built in near future will have to cope with or will have to address. And this is the uh, topic uh, covered at least by um, the Onto Chain project. So, Onto Chain is where blockchains and the semantic web meet. Why? Because uh, the semantic web uh, stack, which is uh, shown in this slide on the right hand side, is about uh, shared. Uh, conceptualization, and you can see on the top of it, we have trust. Uh, so this means we need to trust the information which is being shared on the semantic web. On the left hand side, we have the technology stack um, or the layers of that 
uh, that are related to the on-chain project, which is also about building trust on the basis of shared databases, shared ontologies, and of course, blockchains. In our on-chain project, we have thought about the information needs of semantically complex, dynamic, and again, trust critical ecosystems. Uh, we have thought about uh, the needs of humanity uh, without technology, which means um, the needs for human rights, for diversity and plurality, uh, security and privacy, which exist even before computer science existed. So that is why we um, opened this program of research, which is um, to cover different topics or technology areas for which we, be we believe we can build uh, a sound software ecosystem that will support use cases in the future that are all related about trust. So trustworthy web and social media, trustworthy crowd sensing, uh, social networks and so on. So there are different approaches and uh, things uh, that we, we believe can be integrated in this type of onto blocks. Onto blocks are containing a lot of information that uh, can be trusted. So in a way, information coming from people, coming from sensors, coming from digital twins, from many different places. And by doing a lot of security and consensus on, on this type of information, one could build trust. And by doing so, we believe in the future, it would be possible to build new, new type of uh, information structures, like for example, knowledge forest or knowledge graphs, graphs that can be trans trusted and would come along with the technologies of the semantic web. So this is uh, the context of the on-chain project and I give it forward now to Mirek, Mirko, sorry, uh, who is going to present the Trubla project. In our project, we have uh, currently funded 17 uh, sub projects. You can see them on the website. And we have um, again, more than around 3 million euro funding to be spent on other topics related to our software ecosystem. And the first, the second call is coming up in July this year. So you're welcome also to participate. So now I pass it to uh, Mirko. Thank you. Thank you, Vlado. Um, I just need some instruction to share my screen. Because I cannot see the um, how to get that. Vlado? Uh, I think you just uh, press on the green button, new share on the bottom. Yeah, no, I have a different screen. Sorry about that. I have don't have the control. I had it when we tested it. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, Katya for that. <laughs> I just have... Hi, uh, Vlado, can you please stop sharing your screen? Yes. Oh, no. That should Sorry. be working now. Yes, I'd make it brief. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, yeah, Trublo is part of NGI uh, Next Generation as well. Um, our goal is not semantics, but content. Um, I'm coming from a background of media. I'm uh, an innovation manager at Deutsche Welle located in Bonn and Berlin. And um, this is already our or my second blockchain project. We had one before where we were developing ourselves. That was about the exchange, say, of um, uh, videos, music, and photos. And we built a use case around photos. And it was already interesting to see how the flow of exchange of this creative uh, work is um, difficult. Um, we asked, for example, African photographers in the, the prior project 
um, how easy or difficult it would be for them to interact with uh, European media. And they all told us stories of long delays and so on and so on. So there are a lot of barriers that we could come over. And then there is the issue of trust, as uh, Vlado has said it. So that's what we're trying to tackle here. Um, we are a cascade funding project. We are giving away the money in three calls, um, three open calls. The first one is about to be finished in terms of selecting um, the winning project. We are a little bit behind, we must admit. We want it to be uh, ready in May, and it will take until the end of May to announce uh, the winners. Um, uh, I briefly look into um, our consortium. Um, we uh, uh, have Worldline, which is um, uh, a payment processor that has grown quite large uh, from uh, Spain. We have ICCS from Essence, ATC from Essence. Both are trusted partners for the more scientific side. Deutsche Welle, I already mentioned. Um, we're supported by F6S. They help us quite a bit in reaching the audience. Uh, I, I must say that has worked out very, very well. The F6S platform is a good way for, for projects like us and founders to uh, actually meet each other. And then finally, I would like to briefly mention Alastria. Alastria is um, something special. It's a Spanish blockchain infrastructure provider. Uh, I, liken, I, I like to compare them to something like AWS, what Amazon provides on the classic cloud, to um, something that is um, uh, now available on the cloud. Oh, um, sorry. I, I saw that uh, I get a message. Now I have to see. Now my screen should be possible, uh, um, visible? Yes. OK, sorry, then I, I didn't see the controls before. OK. OK, um, very briefly, right, I have to go back. So um, we will be, um, sorry, a bit off track here. So, uh, so this was a consortium that I just talked about. And um, the main vision is uh, that we want to look into how blockchain can be used to uh, facilitate uh, trust in content. As you all know, um, misinformation, disinformation, sometimes by mistake, sometimes uh, with full intention has led to quite weird results around the world because we are now um, arguing in societies where some of our people uh, are seemingly in a different reality, claiming that all kinds of things are entirely different. And it's quite worrisome that what, what's happened here because it's not just about disagreement, it's about uh, questioning democracy and the forms we would live together and how we tackle things like the pandemic. So the topic is very important. We must enable to some extent that if I read something, I can check whether this is trustworthy and reliable. And that works by, for example, understanding where the content is from. So in order to find solutions for that, we will have three calls. As I just said, the first one is already in the final phase. And the way we are organizing our calls is that um, there will be a first phase, an innovation phase, where 10 selected projects from each call will get funding. And then we will select two out of the 10 for an, another progress phase in order to enable uh, further work on ideas to actually bring them closer to market or scientific or technical um, evaluation. Um, the funding that is available by Trueblow is up to uh, 175,000, uh, 75,000 for the first one and the other one for 100,000. I must admit I'm new to this side of nurturing other projects, but I like it that it's kind of opening up for, say, um, and it's not in any way negative, small ideas, early ideas, small teams that are enabled by the EU to work on such topics because we need them in content. Yeah, and that's already it from me because um, we're gonna have a lot of specific examples now um, in the upcoming stories. And so I sh uh, uh, stop sharing here and um, uh, give back the floor to Vlado. 
Uh, thank you, Mirko. So uh, now we go to the first presenter. Um, and that is uh, Mirek uh, from the Macolab uh, company. Uh, and he will talk about trusted knowledge management. Thank you, Vlado. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mirek Sopek. I represent Macolab, a digital project uh, company that uh, is uh, uh, headquartered in Poland, but uh, has branches and offices uh, all around Europe, in the UK, France, uh, Germany, and the United States as well. Uh, I will be talking today about synergy between semantic uh, and uh, blockchain technologies. Uh, in the bigger goal to build knowledge representation systems that uh, we can trust. And first and foremost, I would like to notice that despite everything that people sometimes say about semantic web languages, and sometimes, you know, say in good, sometimes not very good, and so on so forth, all these opinions, uh, semantic web languages uh, like RDF, which is generic format for semantic data encoding, and OWL, which is a particular format for ontology encoding, specifically interesting for the consortium, uh, could be seen today as a main industry level knowledge representation languages uh, that support transmission of knowledge uh, for digital space. There, of course, there are some other uh, languages like CL, Common Logic, which even has the uh, respective ISO standard. <coughs> and they are even more you know, expressive but they do not have the popularity even in the academic circles. And their usage is sometimes hampered by scarcity of tools like editors, APIs, reasoners, and whatnot. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, almost no doubt that blockchain uh, technologies are, are really something that created trusted data in trustlet, uh, trustless world. And I very much like the um, saying by uh, Kevin Werbach, uh, that used in his famous book saying that uh, blockchain is the technology larded through uh, with trust. Uh, in the beginning of blockchain, when I was speaking about blockchain and opportunities, I used another metaphor. Uh, I said that I was saying that this is something that allows open data to be carved in stone or carved like in stone, so unchangeable, uh, uh, non repudiated uh, and attributed uh, permanently. So, so that was a kind of the metaphor that we use. So because of these two aspects, popularity of semantic web languages and the real trust built by blockchain technologies, <coughs> we could perhaps marry these two technologies. Now, why uh, we marry them? Why we want to uh, create this synergy, this, this sometimes unusual marriage? First, we uh, need to empower semantic data in general and ontologies in particular, which I call one umbrella term knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs have other meanings as well, but that's an umbrella term for, for that kind of the understanding of all these uh, standards uh, with trust. So semantic data with uh, some elements of blockchain can really deliver trust, this last element on the semantic uh, uh, web layer cake. Then we also uh, can enable specific features of blockchains, which is data integrity, uh, confirmability, attribution, non-repudiation, high availability, and more and more and more to the knowledge representation system, which is very interesting on its own. Then um, we can enable true decentralization of knowledge, which is extremely important in the current world uh, for multiple reasons I don't even need to explain. And finally, there are some ingenious inventions of blockchains like NFT, non-fungible tokens, uh, which are unique digital objects, smart contracts and token-based economies that all could be potentially applied to the uh, knowledge, economy of knowledge, knowledge economy and uh, this whole space of knowledge. Imagine just that some piece of knowledge which is unique uh, uh, because you invented that is really unique, is expressed through mechanisms similar to NFT, which are unique and cannot be copied. It's a dream of people who create intellectual work uh, not to have that kind of uh, work being copied uh, without permission. So that's really interesting applications. Now, how to do it? First and foremost, I would like to notice that um, in our opinion, and people may uh, question that opinion and have different opinions, but in our opinion, it is absolutely essential uh, to use some on-chain data strategies for blockchain 
uh, to achieve this goal. Why? Because if you imagine the situation in which pieces of knowledge are somewhere, okay, and only hashes, signatures, and other cryptographic elements are on the blockchain, which is a common strategy today, what happens if this somewhere is broken, disappears, you know, is cracked or attacked or, or what? You have hashes, you have signatures, but you don't have this uh, original knowledge. So that's the idea that is quite difficult. I don't want to go into details. We just have a, such a conviction that we need to have an on-chain data. And you could potentially embed pieces of knowledge, sometimes called in this nomenclature named graphs or subgraphs, uh, into blocks of a blockchain, figuratively, of course, it's much more complicated than that, but you could do that. Uh, and, and that's uh, possible, but there are many reasons why this is not a good solution. Again, no time to explain why uh, today, uh, I mean, but it's much better, much better to really do the opposite thing. So to actually use blockchain methods on top of knowledge graphs expressed through graph databases or located in graph databases, sometimes called triple stars, uh, sometimes uh, with these property graphs uh, called the graph databases in general. And what you do then, you have the subgraph or named graph, which is like an analog of a block on the blockchain. And if you do it properly, you can really create a chain of these elements of knowledge, which are again unchangeable and, uh, and properly uh, trusted in, uh, in the technical sense. Now, uh, what really uh, that led us, it led us to the birth of the idea of graph chain. And the main idea behind graph chain is to use a blockchain mechanism on top of the abstract RDF graph data model. I, again, have no time to explain this notion why abstract and so on and so forth, uh, but uh, that's very important in our conception. And the graph chain is defined as a linked chain of named RDF graphs or subgraphs if we go to other types of graph databases. It of course requires a unique cryptographic approach, unique cryptographic algorithm for calculated digest or hashes of named RDF graphs, which is not trivial as many people know. And finally, a set of blockchain network mechanisms that are responsible for distribution of named graphs among different nodes and peers and achieving consensus and whatnot. In practice, we always, for this last thing, use some underlying or existing blockchain frameworks to achieve that goal. Now, uh, the nice thing about graph chain is that it has uh, a real uh, production level, production grade implementation for the startup that runs in the United States called LEI.info. The startup is a kind of the uh, knowledge graphs for legal entity identifier. Uh, legal entity identifier, if somebody doesn't know, is the primary identifier for companies that trade some financial instruments. I don't want to go into this. Uh, there is almost 2 million companies today on this system, and we were first to create semantic version of that thing and then uh, convert that to a blockchain uh, structure. And what really happens there is that our graph chain runs with Hyperledger in the framework and provides the ultimate validation of the veracity of, of veracity of the data. I mean, it actually says that the data didn't change since the inception of a given uh, record uh, on, on this system. So we have uh, something in, in production running as we speak. Our role uh, in OntoChain and development of graph chain for OntoChain, uh, we believe uh, will be extremely important because uh, it can provide, uh, it can help to have industrial impact because it will open path for much wider use of pure semantic data expressed as RDF, RDF star, actually RDF star is our choice for next steps if we go forward uh, with a consortium and, uh, and again uh, adding blockchain features to such graphs to knowledge graphs increases user trust in, in, in the data and uh, the global vision that we have for that is that with graph chain onto chain can deliver a true third generation blockchain as you know there is you know some nomenclature saying that bitcoin was first ethereum second and there are number of third generation blockchains that are extremely important today. And uh, this, um, an onto chain as third generation blockchain system will be uh, really providing a technical uh, foundation for trusted knowledge representation. And having said that, uh, I, I end my um, presentation. If somebody wants to ask a question, please. Uh, if not, uh, Vlado, I'm, I'm done.
Uh, thank you, Mirak, for your interesting presentation. We have a session uh, in the end, like 15 minutes for question and answers, but everybody yes. is free to uh, post questions uh, and uh, we will answer, we can answer in the end, or uh, if it is easy, uh, then we can answer immediately. Um, so let's go further to the second topic we have for today, which is on the topic of decentralized oracles. It is the interface between the untrusted world that we live in and the trusted world of blockchains. So Anthony Simonet from the iExec company is going to present this, thanks. Hi everyone, thank you Vlado. Uh, so I, I think you've said everything uh, already. Uh, that's the, the main core of my presentation. But anyway, so I'm representing iExec. I am one of the core companies in the Anton Chain uh, ecosystem. And uh, as such, we are providing our companies to the teams and also some guidance into how to build it. And I've been asked uh, today to talk about the specific topic of decentralized oracles. And I'll try to, uh, to explain some thoughts that we have at iExec about uh, how iExec can actually help build um, trusted decentralized oracles. So first, uh, I think, yes, uh, we need to define uh, what are oracles for, uh, for the people who don't know what we're talking about here. So the thing about the blockchain is, is great. And like uh, Mirek, uh, Mirek uh, said, uh, I love your, uh, your analogy, Mirek. You said uh, the blockchain lets open data be carved into stone. And that's really what the blockchain is. Uh, once data is in the blockchain, um, what the blockchain provides is an immutable proof that that's the truth. It has not changed because it's on the blockchain forever. Uh, now the Oracle uh, problem is just before we carve the data in stone, uh, it is about validating the data because once the data is in the blockchain, it cannot change or at least it cannot change easily. So Oracles are responsible for bringing data from the real world, like Vlado said, into the blockchain so that smart contracts and applications, actual uh, regular web two applications that read the blockchain can uh, trust the data. So just a simple example here is, I have an application that needs to know the temperature in London. My blockchain and the smart contracts running on the blockchain are completely isolated from the rest of the world. So they cannot possibly uh, get access to any data, any temperature data, any weather data uh, whatsoever. So the way it works uh, with oracles is we have uh, basically the world on the right here. Uh, it can be sensors, it can be uh, APIs, weather APIs. Uh, it can be uh, you know, sensor networks, uh, uh, videos, uh, cameras filming the sky in London. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is a data source. The uh, blockchain will ask the oracle, what's the temperature in London? And the oracle will in turn ask, uh, some data sources. And the way these data sources are selected and the trust that we put in these data sources really depends only on the Oracle. There is no generic or uh, general assumption about this. Then uh, once the Oracle has acquired data about the temperature in London, say 21.4 degrees Celsius, the Oracle forwards this information to the blockchain in a format that is accepted by the specific smart contracts that requested the data and after some validation. Now the issue, the, the obvious issue with blockchain, it's, it is well known, uh, sorry, with oracles and it is well known is that oracles present a point of centralization. If an oracle is corrupted, usually we think of uh, economic, economical monetary consequences uh, that can be dramatic. But in NGI uh, on the chain, we're thinking of, uh, you know, larger, wider applications where oracles can bring data uh, to uh, a much larger uh, body of, applic of applications that go way beyond just decentralized finance. So then the consequences can be a little more dramatic as well. Uh, I will talk about applications in a little bit, but uh, I would like to just talk about strategies for decentralizing oracles, for trying to break these centralization points that are oracles and uh, talk about the assumptions that this has on trust that we can have into the data that is acquired. So that the most, uh, let's say, trivial 
approach to our goals is just to have one smart contract here in, here in green, uh, trust some of chain relayers that in turn look at data sources. So data sources can just be APIs or it can be something much more complex. But what matters here is that um, the, the Oracle smart contract has to trust at least the relayer or the data source. And there is no guarantee that the relayer will provide actual data from the source, uh, actual data from the actual data source, or there is no guarantee that the data source itself will not lie to the, to the relayer and in turn to the blockchain. A different approach that is a little better is to perform, uh, oops, sorry, I went too fast. Hmm. Okay. Off-chain aggregations. Off-chain aggreg aggregation is basically, I have the same architecture. My smart contracts ask for the data uh, from rela uh, relayers and the relayers this time look at several data sources and perform some kind of aggregation. So it can be median, average, uh, it doesn't matter. The only, uh, the only thing that's important is that the relayer actually looks at different data sources. Now the trust that we can put in this really depends on the technology that we use for implementing these relayers. If it is just a blind black box, blind piece of code uh, that we still have to trust, it's not interesting. If you use things like uh, iExec off-chain off -chain computing, then you can look at the relayer code and look at the actual data sources and trust that the aggregation was actually the one that you wanted in the smart contract. But that does not mean that the data sources were, uh, were the right ones, uh, were not corrupted in the first place. Now we can also do on-chain aggregation. So in addition to all of this, you can perform some aggregation logic from the smart contracts themselves. So you can now have several relayers uh, work, uh, working as regular option task or I exec task, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but you have a wide range of possibilities and you perform some aggregation again, but on the blockchain. And this way, the results of the computation and maybe some score regarding the trust of this, of this score can be also recorded on the blockchain. But it doesn't really, uh, there is no perfect solution here. What I'm trying to say is that we need to build oracles with a mix of all of this to really, uh, increase the score of the trustworthiness of data that we bring to the blockchain. And the one last technique uh, that is emerging is the use of trusted execution environments. So trusted execution environments give you a guarantee, a cryptographic signature that the data coming from your oracles, your relayers, uh, has been audited. So now the smart contract can actually trust the data because it has been signed by a, a hard cryptographic key within an hardware and cloud. Uh, this also this is better, but this still uh, requires uh, code to be to be audited and data sources to be uh, somewhat trusted. But with this technology, uh, uh, decentralized off-chain relayers plus uh, IXT plus GPUs uh, that we also support, you can start to implement very very complex oracles, and this is where I'm going. So now. Uh, the application that we're looking for in the NGI on chain projects are very disruptive applications that uh, go way beyond this very simple use case of price feeds and go into very complex aggregations. So a typical example is machine learning or image recognition. Imagine you have a service that needs to know uh, what's on picture. Usually you would go to a machine learning uh, image recognition algorithm and you, you will ask, what is this? And the algorithm will tell you, I think it's a cat with confidence 0.5. If you combine all of these IXT plus GPU plus on-chain aggregation, then you can have actually several uh, image recognition algorithms all perform the same task with different logic and have this aggregation of the oracles done either on-chain or off-chain with different uh, trust uh, compromises. But now what you have on blockchain, is not only the answer that the picture of a cat, but you have the score and the way the score is computed linked to the data. And this brings applications uh, that are very ambitious. I talked about image recognition, some recognition, you can think about uh, in insurance, uh, resolving conflicts in the real world. You can think about uh, democracy, voting. You can think about uh, crowd sensing with, with uh, areas of network controlled by, by the people and so on. 
And uh, second uh, area of application that I want, uh, that we really want to support in onto chain is one of uh, privacy preserving identity oracles. And here we need to typically think of social networks. Imagine you read a, you read a tweet about someone saying anything about COVID or hear about astronomy. How do you trust that this person actually uh, knows what they're talking about? With iExec T, uh, T, you can actually off-chain validate that this person maybe has a PhD in astrophysics without ever putting the PhD, the diploma, the degree, or anything about the real identity of the person on chain. Uh, so we are looking into uh, their, their knowledge proof protocols, verifiable credentials, uh, self sovereign identities to really come to this uh, onto chain service that would validate that some person has, has some skills or some credentials without uh, revealing their identity to the world. And these are just a few ideas. Uh, so onto chain is getting started. Uh, as for iExec, I encourage you to look at our uh, uh, onboarding uh, programs on developers.ix.ec and also we have a new developer reward uh, program and grant program. So we really want to support these uh, novel applications. We have many ideas. I know that many of you have ideas about uh, this uh, Rackle use case challenge. So be free to, uh, to reach out to me and uh, this is it for now. Thank you. Um, excellent, uh, Anthony. So thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to invite now the third presenter, uh, who is going to present uh, the, the, on the topic of tokenomics and in relation to the Tezos uh, network. So Hadrian, welcome and uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Vlado. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and for giving us the opportunity to, to talk a little bit of Tezos and which will not be the main topic of this presentation, but we'll be talking more about the different kind of tokens you can have on a, on a blockchain. And, and I'm going to share my screen with you. So can everyone see my screen? I think, yes. So the idea of this presentation, as I have 10 minutes, is to uh, present very quickly the Tezos protocol, but to focus more on the different kind of tokens you can have on a blockchain. And we will uh, go through various examples of tokens that are already deployed uh, on Tezos by studying uh, very quickly um, different use cases. So Tezos is a public blockchain, just like Bitcoin or Ethereum, for instance but it has three main characteristics which are very interesting. The first one it is, is that the consensus algorithm of Tezos is based on proof of stake, which means that the, the Tezos protocol consumes very low energy, uh, very few energy. So it's very low uh, consuming uh, in terms of energy. The second main characteristic is what we call on-chain governance. So Tezos is a protocol just like Bitcoin and a, a protocol is a set of computing rules. And the beauty of Tezos is that within this set of rules, you have some rules to modify the protocol. So Tezos has a self-modification characteristics that we coupled with a mechanism of voting that allows owner of XTZ, which is the cryptocurrency of Tezos, which is a utility token, to vote for the evolution of the Tezos protocol. So we, by having this on-chain governance mechanism, eliminate the dependence of hard forks to bring technical innovation. And the last characteristic of Tezos is formal verification. So Tezos is a smart contract platform, which means that you can deploy codes uh, called uh, smart contracts. And uh, with Tezos, you can verify that the code can, uh, is uh, uh, respecting the set of specification on top of which it has been developed. So you can be sure that the smart contract, the code within the smart contract is respecting the specification of the project. So to sum up, three characteristics of Tezos, it, it's very uh, uh, low energy consuming because we, use, we do not use a proof of work consensus algorithm, but a proof of stake one. We have this on-chain governance mechanism, which allows us to evolve without having to hard fork. 
and form a verification which brings a high level of security on our smart contract. So what are the different types of tokens uh, you can have on the blockchain? It can be on Tezos, but on Ethereum or any other blockchains. Um, first of all, you have what we call the utility token, which is uh, generally the cryptocurrency of a blockchain. So for instance, on Tezos, you have the Tez or XTZ. On Bitcoin, you have the BTC or Ethereum, you have uh, the ETH, which are utility tokens. Then you have a, a, a family of tokens called security tokens, which generally we see them because they represent a financial assets that can be uh, a bond or a structured product, or for instance, uh, a real estate asset that you will represent under the form of a token that is called a security token. I wanted to talk as well about stable coins. So stable coins are a kind of token to my mind because they are a digital representation of a fiat currency. And uh, this digital uh, representation is deployed on a blockchain. A different type of stable coin are CBDC, central bank digital currencies. So those tokens are stable coins, but they are collateralized with fiat currency and controlled by a central bank. So we are, no, uh, we are all aware about uh, the, uh, the initiative of the European Central Bank to issue a digital euro. This could be a CBDC uh, and they, it could use as well a blockchain. So it would go into this category of token, which are CBDCs. And they are also a representation of a digital currency, of a fiat currency. Governance tokens governance token are tokens that give a voting power in what we call a decentralized autonomous organization. So a decentralized autonomous organization is a set of smart contracts of code that is deployed on the blockchain. And if you have a governance token, you can vote to uh, modify or uh, decide on the evolution of this organization. So you can uh, decide to modify, for instance, the certain parameters of the smart contracts of this decentralized autonomous organization. So it's a, it's a kind of governed token, uh, which is very interesting. Then you have NFT tokens, non-fungible tokens. Uh, NFT token is a token which is used to represent the uniqueness of an asset. For instance, uh, a painting, or it can be uh, an image or a video. Generally, it, it is uh, very used uh, within the art industry. And you can represent the uniqueness of an asset, which is digital or physical. So now we have seen the different types of tokens existing. I would like to uh, show some use cases so that you have uh, an idea of where they are used. So first example of security token is a project with Société Générale Forge, uh, which is a commercial bank in France, that issued uh, security tokens represented structure product, which is a kind of financial uh, uh, product, financial assets, on the Tezos chain. So this financial asset, the structure product, uh, is represented under the form of a, what we call a security token, which gives certain rights to the owner of or the investor into the, the structure product. So it's a first example of security token. The second example of a security token is a token uh, is a project um, of an investment fund with a, a, a company called Logical Pictures and together with a French bank called BNP Paribas that created a, an investment fund, which is an alternative investment fund in France called 21 Content Ventures. So it's a security token because the idea is that this investment fund, we have done the tokenization of the shares of the investment fund. So every share of the investment fund is represented under the form of a token, which is a security token. And if you have this one of these security tokens, you have a share of the investment fund. Okay, so this is a second example of a security token. And if you have the security token, you have uh, some rights on the, the, um, the, on the, 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 
investment fund and you you have some uh, uh, you you get get some um, feedback as well on the different investment that the investment fund will uh, will uh, will be doing in the future the inter interesting part in this project is that there is also a utility token in this project so if you have some shares if you have some security tokens of the investment fund you will be given utility tokens and this investment fund will be specialized i mean it's already existing into the movie industry which it will exclusively invest into the movie industry so if you have some security tokens representing the shares of the investment fund you will get every year utility tokens that will give you rights to assist to movies or to go to festival de Cannes or to have your name at the end of a movie for instance so here you have an example of a security token that represents uh, the share of an investment fund and you have a utility token which gives you some rights to get some privileges into the movie industry the next example is a stable coin token uh, which is uh, the first euro stable coin i mean it's not a stable coin it's a digital asset but it can be uh, assimilated as a stable coin so it's the first representation of the euro in france uh, and it's a project which has been um, um, launched by a, a retail food company called casino together with Société Générale, which is the bank collateralizing this uh, stable coin. So the idea is that it's a representation of the euro. Uh, it's collateralized fully with fiat. So there is a parity of one one uh, between the number of euros into the Société Générale bank account and the numbers of stable coin uh, LUG, the project is called LUG or Euro L in, in, in circulation. And uh, this is a kind of token which is, can be uh, called a stable coin, for instance, because it's stable uh, compared to the value of the, the asset it is pegged. Uh, in our case, it's the euro. Then CBDC, uh, Central Bank Digital Currency Tokens. This is a project we are working on with Banque de France and Société Générale, which is the issuance of uh, euro, digital euro, that will be done on the blockchain and collateralized by Banque de France. So it's another example of a, a stable coin, but this time it's a bit different because it's controlled and collateralized by a central bank. This project gives an example of a governance token. So this project is very um, is still under development and um, uh, we are still, it's not sure to be launched, uh, but if it's launched, the idea is to create a platform uh, and to give the possibility of to every car owner in France to create a digital passport in which the, uh, the car owner will put all the data of its car. For instance, the price uh, he bought the car, the number of kilometers, the accidents uh, or the repair, the reparation that have been done. And to certify this data, uh, to put this data in the digital passport and to certify this data on a blockchain, in our case, uh, on Tezos. And every car owner, by creating this digital passport, will have the right to put it on the platform that will be governed by Group Peugeot, PSA, which is one of the largest uh, car manufacturers in France, but also with some insurance companies such as uh, Crédit Agricole Assurance, for instance, and to sell the data to, for instance, insurance companies or uh, car manufacturers that will want to access a certified data to, for instance, sell insurance, predictive insurance services or to adapt the production of their, uh, their, the, their uh, production of uh, uh, car, pieces of car, for instance. And what the interesting part of this project is that the platform will be governed with a governance token that will be uh, held by the different companies in the project, such as Peugeot, PSA, or Crédit Agricole, or other companies. So it's a, this example is a token that will give you a voting power to decide for the evolution of the platform. And finally, to conclude this uh, presentation, a non-fungible token uh, asset, um, yes, asset or token, non-fungible token. So this project is um, 
a project with, uh, that has been done recently on Tezos with an artist called Benjamin Spark, uh, together with uh, a Belgium uh, platform called Arteia. And the idea of this project is to represent physical piece of art. In our case, they are paintings. And you will represent, and you can buy it. Uh, it's already deployed. You can buy non-fungible tokens, NFTs, representing the property of the physical asset, which are uh, paintings. So this is an example of a, a token, which is called a non-fungible token, that represents the uniqueness of the asset, which is a physical asset, in our case, a, a painting, and the property. If you have this NFT token, everyone can check it on the blockchain, and it means that you are the owner of this, uh, this painting. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Adrian. So if there are any questions, please put them in the uh, questions and answers. Um, we have uh, maybe uh, a little bit of a delay. So please also keep for the future presenters uh, your time uh, with the time. Uh, so the, sec the next one is focusing on the type of uh, European blockchain services infrastructure may be needed in near future. And we have today Slapnik from Hashnet Solar uh, to present uh, the sea chain uh, infrastructure. Thank you, Vlado. I'll try to share my screen. I hope everybody are able to see. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will uh, try to make it a little bit faster uh, to spend uh, to to reserve some time. Uh, but uh, basically, I will speak uh, about overcoming scalability and performance barriers with uh, more sustainable blockchain infrastructure. Where uh, I will start with this famous tweet from from last week, where uh, Elon Musk pointed out uh, in the end of the tweet about the. Uh, really uh, important issues of sustain sustainability of blockchains. And here uh, I will connect it to the uh, Hashnet blockchain infrastructure being developed by uh, our company. Uh, in the end, I will also touch the first national infrastructure, test infrastructure, C chain that we build it with it. But basically, uh, Hashnet blockchain infrastructure is uh, focused uh, on a kind of new type of more pure and more sustainable uh, decentralized uh, solution. Uh, we have, like with Tezos mentioned, also uh, a private uh, taller hash net chain, but also few, uh, uh, I'm sorry, public uh, uh, taller hash net uh, chain, but also few private one. But the main uh, characteristics uh, of the hash net is that it uh, uses improved redundancy uh, reduce gossip and virtual voting proto protocol, and that it's possible to achieve considerably lower traffic load uh, than conventional push-based gossip and push-pull gossip protocols, uh, while still maintaining uh, the same probability and successful uh, delivery of each transaction. Uh, speaking about scalability, uh, we have performance uh, of 50,000 transactions per second on layer one. And uh, with high latency scenes, the time to finality is up to seven seconds. Uh, solution is also able to support millions of transactions per second if we introduce layer two solution. And also HashNet reaches high scalability with limited increase of the energy demand without compromising on its security. Uh, hash and consensus mechanisms also requires minimum electrical consumption, while uh, the way transactions are recorded needs uh, minimum storage space. Uh, scalability, as we know, turns out to be often mentioned as one of the biggest challenges related to widespread uses of, of blockchain uh, technology. So with the HashNet uh, consensus mechanisms, uh, we know that it determines the level of security of network, of its speed, sustainability, and also scalability. Uh, I have to mention also that uh, uh, using uh, 
for example, uh, proof of authority uh, network uh, with HashNet uh, using hundreds of nodes, uh, the HashNet network is still able to process all transactions really, really fast since the improved RLG and virtual voting mechanism uh, innovation eliminate uh, some inefficiency imposed by other blockchain solu solutions. Um, at uh, on the European level, uh, Hashnet also partner uh, in one uh, project, uh, uh, an open call uh, uh, prepared by European Blockchain Partnership, calling uh, to different uh, consortiums to um, to prepare some uh, solutions for the uh, next generation of uh, protocol, but also next generation of, of European Blockchain Service in infrastructure and. Uh, here in the partnership uh, with other uh, partners, we propose such a solutions where we were describing um, how we will be able to reach uh, these high uh, demands uh, uh, in the future use of European blockchain service uh, infrastructure, where we define the usage of side chains uh, uh, and uh, uh, the solutions uh, uh, connected layer one and uh, layer two. Uh, uh, solution uh, solutions on the uh, on the uh, blockchain infrastructure but i have to mention that uh, the throughput uh, which uh, would be a cumulative com value of main and side chain uh, will of course create uh, on second uh, on first and second level uh, quite big scalability potentials also uh, uh, for, for blockchain uh, technology using HashNet, uh, HashNet as such. But coming to the uh, C-Chain uh, National Blockchain Service Infrastructure, um, I have to mention that uh, our company together with the uh, uh, national uh, telecom uh, uh, provider uh, Telemark in Slovenia, we launched it uh, as a test network in December 2019 uh, as a private network, but uh, having the main, uh, let's say, capabilities uh, mentioned already explaining the uh, basic HashNet uh, technology protocol, that is much faster uh, with a high volume of transactions, that is much cheaper to use because of lower uh, energy uh, consumption, and it's quite easy to use because uh, uh, it's a uh, solution uh, with uh, Ethereum virtual machine integrated, and it's uh, it enables exist, uh, existing decentralized application to be easily migrated or developed uh, on, on top of it. Um, what is C chain now? Uh, it's as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, test national blockchain infrastructure uh, in uh, Republic of Slovenia, running on seven nodes that are hosted by. Uh, Telemach, uh, national telecom operator. We already integrated few use cases on it, uh, mentioning blockchain e-delivery, uh, document uh, notarization. It also enables smart contracts and data storage on-chain and, and off-chain. And what we use C-Chain for, for now is for basic test transactions, also to introduce uh, these technolo technology solutions either to private, either to uh, to to public uh, stakeholders, uh, we try to prove the uh, functionality of HashNet protocol with various testing. We are also involved in uh, performance testing of uh, European blockchain service infrastructure as two of uh, selected protocols that are now in the phase of evaluation by European Blockchain Partnership to be used uh, as a future uh, potential future protocols in EPSI. But we also, together with various partners, are identifying uh, different testing uh, use cases uh, to be integrated, tested uh, on C-Chain. And also, in the uh, uh, last few months, we uh, collaborate with various national uh, uh, European member states initiatives. Uh, uh, one of them was already mentioned, Alastria from Spain, but also with others. Uh, that are already building their national blockchain infrastructures. Uh, here, of course, we are trying to uh, collaborate on the solutions to uh, make uh, testing on cross-blockchain infrastructure uh, connectivity 
uh, trying to uh, assure interoperability for different and various use cases to be integrated uh, on this cross, cross blockchain infrastructure um, network. Here, I, uh, I, will, uh, I will end my presentation, of course, uh, with uh, openness for collaboration, either inside on, on the chain project or uh, widely with some uh, other, either infrastructure providers, either the companies who are developing some use cases that could be integrated on our national C chain infrastructure. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much uh, today. Uh, so it was very interesting to see this type of um, basic, uh, let's say, ground or infrastructure works uh, undergoing in Europe. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next presentation now. An essential ingredient and what happens also at European level are the digital identities. And uh, there are very uh, much innovative uh, ways of how one can deal with the identities. So here we have one of the onto chain sub projects uh, from the Gimli uh, company and Casper is going to present this to us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Vlado, for that uh, introduction. My name is uh, Kasper, founder at uh, Gimli, um, and uh, we are part of the Ontechain project uh, with our expertise on self-sovereign identity. Um, so why self-sovereign identity? Uh, uh, we clearly live in a, a rapidly uh, digitizing world uh, where uh, large parts of our lives, activities, and interactions take place online. This was already the case. But COVID has accelerated this dra dramatically um, um, uh, um, with business, businesses uh, migrating to uh, remote work and where friends and family are having um, uh, Friday night drinks uh, over Zoom. And at the same time, it seems like not one week goes by without a new major data breach, uh, putting many of our email addresses and phone numbers and passwords right there out on the streets. Um, so uh, we're being confronted with the fact that uh, a secure identity layer has been missing since the invention of internet. And to make it worse, any digital identity solutions that do exist are run by corporations who most important uh, business model is to collect as much personal uh, information as they can uh, from the consumer. But this uh, hoarding of data is not only uh, a concern to consumers because hackers are increasingly also targeting businesses um, and uh, uh, by, by using uh, stolen passwords from their employees. Um, and uh, the estimated uh, cyber crime damages uh, are estimated to be $6 trillion this year. Um, so the main issue here is that the system for both identity and data collection uh, is centralized and the user has very little control. It's forced to share the data every time again when they use a new service. And the uh, huge amount of data that's being collected makes the central databases very attractive to targets, uh, to be targeted by hackers. In self sovereign identity, we aim to turn this whole system around and to get users back in control of their data. Uh, the, this architect here, uh, is a wonderful system that allows for selective disclosure of data and verification of this data without the need for a central authority. So the user gets back in control and the identifying uh, data can be uh, transported between different services. This uh, not only greatly increases the uh, security and privacy, uh, it also strongly reduces the data processing and compliance costs. I wanted to put in, in some uh, thoughts that, that, that are uh, worth considering when talking about identity and trust and self-sovereign identity specifically. Um, uh, uh, three thoughts that I, I put out there and maybe we can discuss them later about inclusivity. How can we ensure that the SSI systems that we are now developing will serve everyone and not just a small part of uh, the world maybe that has access to smartphones, for example. And um, also a bit more from a theoretical perspective uh, when thinking uh, about self-sovereign identity and decentralization as, as, as a full paradigm shift. But how is this really different from 
previous technology revolutions, uh, which were hailed as the next uh, disruptive uh, wave of technology, such as nanotechnology or biotechnology, which did some nice things, but well, they didn't really save the world in that sense. Um, and also, um, I think that part of the answer there might be in the fact uh, around the alignment of interests, where the human rights to privacy and the enterprise need for uh, reducing uh, risk and reducing complexity costs uh, are nicely aligned. But uh, let's also consider to what extent are those benefits and those interests really going to outweigh the huge economic value of data collection right now. Um, so with Gimli, we're focusing on self-sovereign identity as, as, as a building block in pretty much anything for the future of internet. We are in uh, uh, two European projects, one of them uh, being on chain, the other one in Asif Lab, where we are focusing on uh, uh, NFC uh, hardware wallets so that you can use SSI also without a, a smartphone. Um, we're working on a number of uh, uh, W3C um, uh, specifications to allow also for delegated and uh, multi-signature uh, authorizations. Um, also uh, working on NFTs that have a identity layer, which is currently missing and which is um, uh, quite badly needed also in the NFT space uh, to really fulfill the potential. Um, Finally, I want to go through very briefly to the Ontochain project, where we are also focusing on a application suite uh, that consists of a mobile app, a data portal, and a management portal, uh, because these three things together are really needed to leverage self-sovereign identity in an in a ecosystem of trust. Um, but maybe I'll leave it at this, actually, for, for more details. Uh, of course, you can, you can reach out. Um, you can also reach out if you want to collaborate on one of these um, uh, uh, European projects in the SF Lab or in Ontochain. Uh, we're always interested to look for uh, use cases where we can implement, for example, these uh, NFC cards as uh, physical identifiers. And in Ontochain, uh, we'll be on the lookout for uh, parties that uh, want to collaborate on building or implementing uh, uh the the data management portal and the identity management portal um, and finally we are hiring expanding the team looking for uh, enthusiastic and talented uh, uh, developers uh, to take up uh, a leading role in these bleeding edge technology projects so that is uh, my presentation thank you i wonder if there are any Questions or so we can also write them in the questions and answers. Uh, so okay. uh, I think uh, if there are any questions, please go ahead uh, from the audience. You can type them in, and people can read them and answer either by typing or by speaking. But so thank you, Kaspar. And I think uh, I would like to request a small switch between the two presentations. So if uh, we could, instead of having um, currently the, the third presentation, because Sebastian has to leave uh, later on. So please, Sebastian, could you uh, go with your presentation now? Yeah, sure. Um, let me see. Share the screen. Um, ready when you are. Can I start? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for attending. And uh, Mirko, thank you for inviting me in this uh, important uh, set of presentations. And uh, yeah, my name is Sebastian, founder of WordProof and chairman of the Trusted Web Foundation. Um, we have a very uh, warm relation with NGI because uh, NGI did a, the competition blockchains for social good organized in 2019. Uh, we were winners of that contest and uh, I'm a super, yeah, we're super proud that they on behalf of Europe organized not only something regarding to blockchain, but especially blockchains for social good because that's what this 
technology and communities can do. Not only, uh, it's not only Bitcoin, it's not only value, it's a whole infrastructure, open source community driven to build a better world. Lots of social good in there. Uh, and that's what we focus on with word proof because even though the internet has brought us many good things, it has a deep rooted issue with trust. And it's quite obvious that it happened as trust simply wasn't part of the internet's design. The internet was built to connect computers with computers and computers. They have no dreams. They don't care about power or self enrichment as they have no egos, but we humans do. And therefore today on the internet, we suffer fraud and manipulation and theft all on a daily basis. And therefore search engines and social media aren't the safe places we are used to anymore. And all this trouble on the internet, and um, it will be a positive story in the end, I promise you. But all this trouble on the internet echoes back to society. So to save the world, we need to fix the internet. We need truth, the ability to find truth, uh, to be part of the internet's design. And uh, tr finding truth and trust can be built with two building blocks. Firstly, it's transparency. So, for example, how did information change over time? And secondly, accountability. Who's the sender of information? And a blockchain timestamp, blockchain technology uh, was invented for timestamping, offers exactly those two things. A possibility to bring transparency to information. And secondly, and, and that's what Cosper talked about with uh, standardization. They are doing great stuff at Gimli to... Uh, with self-sovereign identity, it's an open source way to define identities. It's a rapidly evolving space and they're spearheading that movement. Um, in that way, you can take accountability for the timestamps you placed. Of course, we all know Bitcoin, but uh, a reference in the Bitcoin white paper is to uh, this white paper from 1991 describing uh, blockchain and how it was invented for timestamping. So, uh, 30 years and three and a half months ago, this paper was published describing how you can show that you didn't tamper with documents, with information. And what we do at Wordproof and the Trusted Web is uh, fighting for an internet where all information that matters is transparent and accountable through what blockchain was invented for, timestamping. We made um, a short video, two minutes, on how timestamping can lead to a trustworthy internet. Here it comes. Hey, this is Sebastian and I believe that to save the world, we need to fix the internet and trust must become part of the internet's DNA. And this is what a timestamp does. It brings transparency and accountability to information that matters. From news outlets to legal documents and from e-commerce to social media, timestamping is an open source solution for restoring trust on the internet. This is how it works. Each piece of content has a unique fingerprint, the hash. And that hash is unique for that state of the content. So modify only one small detail and the hash changes completely. By storing this hash in a blockchain transaction, you can forever prove that state of the content at a certain moment in time. To take it one step further, a person or organization can take accountability for its content by connecting an identity to that timestamp. Now sites can choose to show a timestamp certificate so that readers can verify how content changed over time and who exactly published it. See it as bringing every piece of content to a notary at the moment of publishing. And while a notary is slow and expensive, a timestamp is instantaneous and it only costs cents. True standardization, even search engines and social media can read and verify timestamps right in the language that they understand. The more transparency, the higher content should rank and the more accountability, the higher content should rank. And as a result of that, freedom of speech no longer automatically means freedom of reach. 
And so in a few years from now, if information that matters isn't timestamped, you'll be considered a fraud. Citizens, consumers, policymakers, social media and search engines, they will simply wonder if you don't timestamp, what are you hiding? So join the timestamp revolution and let's build the trusted web together. So that's in a nutshell how open source timestamps build towards a trustworthy internet where all information that matters is transparent and accountable. Um, we work together with search engines. So uh, one week back, we um, published uh, the announcement that by the start of next quarter, a small search engine will label in the search results um, the timestamps, uh, the content that is timestamped, which is a big step forward because around 70% of all the content uh, on the internet or, or all the visits to content on the internet is discovered through social media or search. Um, how we edu educate policymakers and um, policymakers and search engines is that firstly, there was the unregulated internet. Then we as Europe had great intention to build a better internet through GDPR. Um, so better rights for the data of uh, the citizens of Europe and furthermore, the whole globe. And a logical next step, a logical successor after GDPR is a trusted web where all information that matters is um, the, the source can be verified. Is it really that person? Is it really that organization? And how information changed over time. So we see a trusted web as a successor of GDPR. It's a real life use case. Uh, these are numbers from last month. So today over 3 million uh, articles are timestamped, uh, all from uh, mostly from quality publishers. So two out of the three largest publishers in the Netherlands are using uh, WordProof for timestamping their information and uh, providing the uh, timestamps through schema.org. That's the language that search engines uh, understand. Some use cases, you can find all of them on our website. So Media House, uh, NRC is one of the biggest publishers in the Netherlands with over 50 million uh, uh, page views a month. Uh, they are using it. The Persgroep, DPG Media is another large one. Uh, all the use cases are on our website. And what I will do, every part in this presentation is clickable. So I'll send uh, over the slides to Mirko so he can uh, share them with all of you. We build a whole ecosystem, tools integrating with uh, every, we yeah, have most content management system, most e-commerce platforms. So uh, yeah, there's a whole ecosystem. If you click on it, you can, uh, on every element, there's more elab elaboration. All the stakeholders of the internet, so for the consumers, we, they deserve a trusted web. Site owners can improve the internet and uh, yeah, making transparency part of their competitive advantage. Search engines and social media make a higher quality search result through timestamping, through the acknowledgement of timestamps. Governments build towards a more trustworthy and verifiable society. And for advertisers, that's a whole different beast, but they, for them, they can use the timestamp infrastructure to make sure that their advertising shows next to, uh, yeah, information that comes from uh, trustworthy sources. We did a lot of research on the state of misinformation. In two weeks, we will have a publication on trust in digital publishing. You can find that on thetrustedweb.org, um, all without leaving an email address. You can all download reports on state of misinformation in Europe and United States, and soon on Asia, we'll all, they're all available there on the website. And that's it, a brief overview on what we work on at WordProof, the timestamp company and the Trusted Web uh, Foundation, the vehicle to educate uh, on all use cases regarding timestamping and content. So thank you very much, Sebastian. And, and if you have a question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Apologies for the switch, uh, but uh, because of the time, uh, time available to Sebastian, we had to switch. Sebastian, many thanks. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for the flexibility in your schedule. Uh, if... Thank you very much. And uh, uh, please answer the question before you, you leave. Uh, there is oh. a question for you. So now I would like to ask uh, for presentation, uh, Artem Bagger, 
uh, who comes from uh, IBM research in Haifa. And they're working on very uh, exciting uh, research problems of integration uh, of blockchains with databases. And uh, because databases can contain valuable information, I think uh, it's an interesting uh, thing to also explore in our workshop on trust management. So Artem, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, so can you, can you see my presentation? Yes. Very good. So as Elado mentioned, and thanks for introduction, I'm going to, to talk about the blockchain database, the research work that uh, uh, myself and my team was uh, working about uh, on uh, for last uh, a year and a half. And uh, the, the key, key goal is to basically provide a, you know, a highly available, secure and immutable and replicated uh, database with uh, blockchain uh, properties. So essentially, what does it mean, a, a, a blockchain database? So uh, what did we do and uh, what was the, the key purpose? And I think the, the, the key goal and the motivation for, for building a, a, a blockchain database or it, considering going to this direction is to provide a centralized trusted database with the blockchain properties because we, we realize that uh, many businesses that you know uh, would like to enjoy the benefits of the blockchain uh, with respect to the provenance and visibility of the data but uh, you know uh, however they don't necessarily want or need the complexity that comes with a, a, a decentralization nature of the blockchain and that's why our research focuses mostly on simplifying the usability and reducing the management overhead for a use case, their trusted cloud provider operates the solution, and that's exactly there. Uh, I believe the blockchain database uh, uh, provides a perfect match. So what we uh, developed is a database with data-centric API, allowing a easy manipulation of the data uh, with the transaction semantics. Uh, with a uh, very familiar to ev everyone and you know for many years uh, developers i get used to work with a uh, uh, re relational databases or oh, uh, <clears throat> for a few past years a uh, uh, key value databases so we would like to uh, we wanted to keep it as simple as that uh, providing the, the the simplicity and the the, the uh, familiarity with the programming model uh, uh, used uh, with uh, conventional databases, reusing the storage engine and basically uh, making it a uh, uh, pluggable. So for, for, no, for now, for the PUC, or no, sorry, it's not, it's not already not a PUC. So for the uh, J that we built, we uh, utilized the uh, Go level uh, database implementation, but it's uh, something that is pluggable. It could be re replaced with different uh, database engines. Uh, we're providing a replication for the to, to simplify deployment and operational management. However, again, this is a conventional database uh, speaking for from 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 in terms of the programming model. So everyone who get used to write SQL queries, to 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 write an applications that utilizes the the document uh, or key value uh, kind of storage, uh, they, they they can continue to do it, but. We also provide an additional uh, value by introducing a properties that is a uh, gained, as you know, if we, we can say that, uh, from the from the blockchain. So we, we can uh, guarantee the immutability and the temporal evident ledger that basically utilize data structures such as a hash chain, hash skip list, Merkle tree, and Patricia Merkle tree in order to support and provide the aforementioned uh, uh, properties. We also uh, guarantee non-repudiation by requiring clients uh, to provide signature over the transactions and also including uh, uh, servers signatures on responses. And moreover, and not less important, we also uh, 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 providing the provenance engine or provenance mechanism and there we utilize a graph embedded graph store there we uh, basically uh, uh, 
uh, decompose the content of the each transaction in the graph structure such that we can utilize a graph-like algorithms in order to do a very comprehensive uh, queries on top of the data that we uh, historical data that is persisted within the the blockchain database so what it does not have it does not have a decentralized trust, so there is no uh, need for you know, building a decentralized consortium to, to run an agreement because, again, the key purpose here is to provide a centralized solution there, uh, you know, there is an organization or cloud provider that uh, anyway is going to host uh, the, the, the platform and it's already in a sense trusted. And therefore, uh, there is no real need for decentralization. And uh, also, since we implying the same programming model as you know, as every one of us familiar from the uh, relational databases or key value databases, there, there is no layer of smart contracts. So the application layer is completely responsible uh, for implementing the business logic. Okay. So that's uh, the, the 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 high level of what is uh, stands for the blockchain database. Now, uh, uh, why why to to build a blockchain database? So exactly exactly as I mentioned, uh, there there are many current decentralized solutions that uh, already trust the cloud provider. So, uh, but still organization that uses the the the, the solution uh, they uh, mutually distrusted so they don't necessarily have to trust each other although they do, they do have a, a cloud provider that is trusted but again they they, they still need to 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 to, to uh, have guarantees that the data or the, the of integrity of the data and the the completeness and soundness of the transactions that is running by the application and uh, therefore, either all organization uh, must trust the cloud provider, or uh, there might be a single organization that is trusted by everyone who is responsible to maintain the uh, the solutions. And uh, there are a few few known examples. For example, Traden, Tradens and IBM Full Trust. There, but by the end of the day, the entire infrastructure is running with a, a, within a IBM blockchain platform and the suppliers uh, uh, trusted IBM to, to, to run it correctly so that uh, that model could be uh, simplified uh, if needed uh, by uh, utilizing the blockchain database and uh, uh, again the the, 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 the the core reason of doing it is again instead of replacing a database with the blockchain uh, to, to, to have uh, properties of non repudiation immutability and provenance, we rather extend a, a existing databases with the blockchain capabil capabilities uh, to enable sim say, simplicity in application development, configuration, and operational management, reduce implementation effort, and exploit uh, the fact that uh, users already uh, uh, trust cloud providers to a certain extent. And again, that will allow to scale for both data, millions of documents, and transaction volume. And the last, but uh, again, not less important, is to reduce the operational cost of the uh, of the of, of uh, the end solution there they needed. And and uh, just to make uh, a bit clear, what are the use cases that a, a blockchain database can support? So uh, if there is a need to maintain a complete and a verifiable track of uh, records without a, without a, sorry, a, 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 without a need of a decentralization or a, to provide a tra trust wealth mechanism for verifying the fact that the transaction has not been altered after the fact of uh, being submitted, for example, insurance company that might need to prove that a, a insured amount has to uh, not been manipulated, or auctions uh, they need to prove that a winner a bid a particular amount, and also you know a businesses my, my, a, can also consider compliance need. For example, requiring preserving the entire history of transactions and the the, the, the potential use cases might might be 
the human resources department within the organization that has to preserve the, the whole history of uh, a employee within the company and uh, every single uh, particular change. Uh, or if you would like to have or you need to, to provide and guarantee a compliance mechanism, for example, for a, a application deployment within your, uh, your cloud, you've been able to extract the information and uh, proof for, for the concrete state. But again, since you are running it within your own on premises and uh, there is no real need to utilize a full fledged a uh, blockchain platforms like you know hyperledger fabric ethereum or bitcoin but yet you still need to provide a, 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 a terms and ability to prove for a uh, data integrity and compliance and uh, that's there the blockchain database might become a uh, very handy and uh, let me give you a, a one uh, one example so Department of Motor Vehicle Management System might be a, a good example of uh, their uh, blockchain database might be a good fit. Uh, so, you know, we can think of Department of Motor Vehicle, a DMV that has to approve transactions that issues a new car uh, that basically would like to introduce within the system. And you can think of, a, of something that, you know, kind of a minting transaction and proof transactions that transfer ownership between, between a, a, two owners of the car. There are a car dealer that a, submits a mint request to introduce new car into the system and the car owners that basically own the car and eligible to transfer ownership between a, a, car, a car owners from one car owner to another. And, a, you know, again, the DMV will own the whole system of, uh, of information with respect to the uh, uh, motor vehicle management. And we can uh, write an application. We can imagine that we can implement easily the application that allow on and facilitate uh, the, the management of uh, transactions between you know, a car ownership exchange, uh, introducing the new car and DMV uh, officer or, 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 or agent approving transactions and yet we will still provide the, the full the full uh, provenance and non-repudiation being, uh, being able to 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 vouch and provide attestation of data integrity and correctness of a, a transaction execution now uh, what uh, if, if you if, if the high level overview of the system or, or the component that uh, we, we implemented in, in the way it works I think it's it's fairly simple, but yet uh, interesting. It might uh, elaborate a bit of what uh, has been done with the, within the context of the blockchain database implementation. So you you can think of a, a transaction being introduced in, into the system, submitted to the transaction uh, service, uh, enqueued into the uh, transaction of the ordering component, uh, where we, where we can uh, basically in, introduce dependency graph across the transactions, so we can uh, optimize and a, a reduced amount of conflicts. Once transactions uh, is reordered, uh, it's been replicated and uh, recorded within the, within the ledger after the validation of the correctness and been indexed within a ledger world state, uh, provenance database and state mercantile tree for the, uh, and which is used uh, to, to, to extract proof of inclusion of information or inclusion of, of, of your transaction within the, the, the blockchain database. Once uh, the process is completed, uh, we will re re return a response back to the client and that completes the, the, the transactions uh, transaction flow. So uh, I will pause here to see whenever you have any questions. If not, I can, I think we can finish here. Thank you, Artem. Uh, so I think we need to speed up just a little bit. If there are any questions for Artem, please go on with the uh, typing the questions in from the audi audience. Okay, so you see my screen? Yes. Mm, I think, yeah, I don't like this controls on the top of the screen, but I think it's okay. Okay, so uh, my name is... Uh, Panasis Papayuanu. Uh, I'm a senior researcher and lecturer at uh, Athens University of Economics and Business, Department of Computer Science. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, trust assessment by means of reputation management in the blockchain. So, yeah, what is our objective here at uh, on the chain? Why it is difficult? And uh, what we can achieve? Our general vision is uh, 
to to really offer in, in the with the on chain framework to offer trustworthy services and data exchange and trustworthy data handling and uh, this trustworthy world uh, is uh, is key to our um, is a key offering of our platform so we cannot do that without assessing the trustworthiness of the di of the different entities of the system or of the diff different data items that are or services that are exchanged. So let's assume that all these are entities. But coming back to the original uh, to the original uh, consumption of the of our uh, platform, uh, where we identified several uh, problems in uh, in the current internet and uh, several security threats in the everyday lives of people in the internet that would uh, benefit from a trustworthiness assessment. First of all, we realized that there is uh, too much uh, power centralized or uh, concentrated in a very few big companies so that they can uh, uh, really do whatever they want with our data, with uh, the network connections that we have to, uh, to really establish uh, lots of control to our lives. And the uh, second problem that we identified was about the provenance of information. There is some overlap, of course, with uh, some of uh, the content presented already by other speakers, but um, also there is some uh, there is some new part, some innovative part, as you will observe. Uh, so where the information comes from? Is it uh, credible? And uh, who actually is the author of uh, everything which is related to to the presentation, uh, the previous presentation on uh, for for WordPress, for example. But there are other kind of provenance questions, even more complex. For example, you could have a data set of scientific data, and you alter a little bit this data set, and you claim that the data set is yours. And then this cryptographic hashes could not help very much. But of course, for publishers, this would make sense. The WordPress approach, I mean. Uh, what what other problems do we have? While we want anonymity in the internet, uh, at the same time, we both not have so much an anonymity. We are continuously tracked by these uh, giants, and uh, and at the same time, um, at the same time, the anonymity is just enough to to allow. Uh, fraud to be still in place in many services exchanged over the internet. And uh, finally, there is there are no fair rewards for uh, good quality contributions like the user feedback or the user reviews on several products or other kind of social services that we provide on top of the internet. And there are some free, free riders that benefit from that alone. Uh, Moreover, there is some bias in AI software. For example, search engines can really show uh, higher services that they choose to, or sites that, or information that they choose to boost. And of course, uh, I already mentioned uh, the problem of uh, fraud, but there is a general uh, problem with uh, cyber threats that can that can come that can arise from our uh, everyday life online. Uh, so the blockchain technology in general can uh, alleviate most of these problems, in theory at least, but not as it is, not at, not at layer one, not at the basic logic that everything is recorded in a distributed ledger and now everyone is safe. Um, okay, there is a promise. There is, there are some advantages. If I can move this, yes, perfect. There are some advantages that blockchain is expected to bring in e-commerce. For example, it is anticipated that it will bring down the costs because uh, the transactions are going to uh, to happen uh, in uh, in a distributed software that. I mean, not big investments uh, are expected to be required in hardware and software, 
for uh, selling uh, services and goods online. Uh, it is expected to be more robust against uh, cyber threats through, through this uh, collective uh, control of what is recorded in the blockchain uh, through the consensus mechanisms. Uh, it is expected to have faster transactions, faster than bank to bank transfers, at least, or wire transfers. Um, and uh, even more, even better, smart contracts uh, can automate several e commerce processes like uh, issuing the receipts or inventory management or billing, or uh, as somebody said uh, previously, can do even uh, uh, some price setting. Uh, I can, can solve even some price setting problems like uh, uh, window determination noxious, um, in theory, okay? Not as they are right now. Also, they are expected to boost the trade around the globe because uh, wherever is internet, uh, the transactions can happen by transferring uh, digital assets. We don't have to have visa. Uh, and. Uh, we can, uh, of course, through the distributed ledger, monitor the supply chain. This is true already. And we can boost the genuinity of, uh, of reviews because uh, every opinion will be associated to some entities. And then based on that, you can attribute something or basically you can build consensus even on reviews. Uh, OK, but. Before going to what actually is offered by the blockchain in terms of trust, let's come up with some definitions of trust. What is trust? So basically is a belief that uh, an entity has a certain property. That's, a, that's the thing. It's a one way, it's mostly subjective. And uh, although trust in overall trust into something of, I mean, trust for some specific property is, can be subjective and it is subjective in nature. Um, honesty is objective. Trust that someone is honest based on the law. And the transitivity in trust networks that, for example, if Alice uh, trusts Bob and Bob trusts Eve, then, Bob is expected to trust him to some extent, but this is not always true for interpersonal trust, but it is true generally for institutional trust. So if an institution that I trust trusts somebody for a certain property, then I trust that somebody for that property. And this is also linked to the notion of verifiable credentials that we will come up, that we will come with later. Uh, often trust is built by means of reputation, which is a metric basically, or by means of verifiable credentials. And what are these? Reputation is a likelihood uh, metric uh, based on some feedback. Feedback can be assumed to be a vote that uh, can be anonymous or named that goes into a ballot. And then a reputation metric is calculated, which is actually a likelihood the metric that the entity possesses a certain property, which can be trust uh, for something. And verifiable credentials are tamper, uh, tamper evident claims and metadata that uh, cryptographically prove they are issued. For example, uh, identification cards that have been uh, issued by uh, an employer, digital birth certificates that have been issued by the state, uh, or digital uh, educational certificates by a university. The underlying principle of all this uh, mechanism is the following, that since these trusted authorities issued these credentials, then these credentials should be trusted. So it's this transitivity property of the trust. Um, so do we have trust in the blockchain? This uh, blockchain is called trustless infrastructure. But is it really? In fact, 
some trust is assumed to be there, but it is distributed among the different actors in the system. And what is this level of trust? We trust the different entities, the different actors, the different nodes, that they are going to follow the, proto the protocol. But they also have the economic incentives to follow the protocol. What does it mean? That to follow the consensus rules and to really obey, not to tamper with uh, the software that uh, really records blockchains because they don't have any financial incentive to do so. This is the trust behind blockchain and these majority rules that are applied in the consensus building. And what else is secure there? We know that whenever we submit uh, a digital asset from one wallet to another wallet, this transaction is secure. And uh, there is security guarantee against double spending. Okay? So whatever is spent once cannot be spent again. Uh, but there are no security guarantees against fraud or low quality. Okay, so. As I said, and why is that? Why we don't have guarantees on um, fraud against fraud or low quality? So, okay, sorry about that. Uh, first of all, we have to have in mind that wallet IDs are not always linked to identities of real people. So there can be the problem that economists uh, say that is a moral hazard problem. So we can have some bad behavior or some bad performance by people because we don't know exactly who they are. And the quality of service provided in the blockchain transactions is also uncertain. So what is the problem if we don't deal with this problem? That the, the blockchain services are going to evolve to a market of lemons. So minimal or zero quality will be distributed against the blockchains against, uh, unless, unless we deal with this quality of service uncertainty. And uh, there is no data provenance by nature or credibility. And there are no uh, data identifiers. As I said previously, you can have a data set exchanged and then this data set again exchanged by the by the guy that bought it before as if it was his own. And the loads restriction in the blockchain transactions is very co complex. There are silos of jurisdictions and information may be very hard to find or uh, not be stored in a way that scales. And uh, okay, what are the challenges for reputation management or verifiable credentials here? I mean, what are the challenges for building a decentralized reputation system or a decentralized uh, system for uh, trustworthiness assessment? First, it's uh, not weak as, uh, as the weak, but we with A here, uh, it's not strong identities. Um, so we don't have strong identities in the blockchain. We have to do something about this or to link the several not strong identities, weak identities to some real identities whenever necessary for trustworthiness purposes. Thanasis, I just want to mention that we have 10, 10 minutes left, sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm finishing. So uh, second, uh, we don't, I mean, as usual for in reputation, we don't have um, any kind of uh, idea whether the feedback that is provided by se several people or not, uh, it is credible or not. And they, that can be biased. And uh, it can be biased because of the fear for retaliation. So how also, uh, Aside, uh, apart from uh, dealing with the feedback, how to securely store, retrieve, or update reputation in decentralized settings? How, how to link this reputation to entities or the feedback that they provide to actual transactions? Uh, so, what do we do here in AutoChain? We plan to, or we are 
already doing it through several uh, sub projects. We are linking identities to real people or trusted entities. But at the same time, we protect the linkability of the feedback information to, to the people that provide this feedback. Uh, and uh, we are building smart oracles for reputation feedback so that we ensure feedback credibility. And uh, we are linking reputation feedback to real blockchain transactions, which is a difficult problem where, because you have to link the feedback to the transactions, but not reveal the identities at the same, and at the same time store this feedback in a scalable way. And uh, we plan to update the reputation information based on uh, smart contracts, which uh, can be different for different uh, for aggregating reputation feedback to different reputation metrics. And uh, also maintain reputation information for registered entities in a subscription basis. And this is my last slide. So the idea is to build the reputation for everything as a service. So reputation can be there for uh, either things or people or in, the, in general digital identities. The semantics of reputation are maintained with reputation data, off chain. Uh, feedback oracles can ensure the genuity of uh, ratings and reviews. There is no central point of failure, so no single entity accumulates all reputation information, but through smart contracts, the reputation can be accumulated and calculated on demand. And, uh, and we are going through a, we are going towards a scalable solution with sustainable economics so that whenever an entity subscribes into the system, a reputation record is maintained for this entity and it's given out to every people that are interested upon a fee. It's so the, yes, it yeah. was my last sentence that we that we have a scalable solution, yeah, that we're aiming towards a scalable solution with sustainable economics behind it. Uh, let's Thank go you. with uh, Ian's uh, presentation. So we're just uh, over time, but uh, we need to uh, follow the agenda of the workshop. So the final presenter will be Ian and he will talk before he takes his flight, his first flight in two years. Yeah, it's about 15 months or something, but yeah. Um, okay, so you see my screen? Yes. I seem to. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, Okay, so uh, um, I'm Ian Taylor, uh, professor at University of Notre Dame and uh, founder and CTO of SimbaChain. Um, we're going to go through the SimbaChain platform, what we've managed to um, uh, build up there, and, and that's going to lead to kind of a use case, which uh, we've been working on with a restaurant company in Mexico called Tox, um, just to show kind of uh, what, what aspect we're, we're working on there. So the SimbaChain platform, uh, uh, this is the high level sort of view of how we look at applications. Essentially, we take data from applications. We're, we're um, you know, focusing more in sort of tracking, uh, provenance tracking, which is the kind of area of the talk. Um, so we have these uh, this data coming in from various uh, uh, places. So in this circumstance, there's a, there's a, a parcel that's being tracked in geographical uh, locations with different modes of transport. And that's fed into um, a model actually of how those uh, data, those assets and the, and the transitions of those assets relate to each other. And those that model of those relationships is actually kind of part of the smart contract. It's annotated into the smart contract. Um, and this uh, basically results in connected structured data on chain um, when, when we record it, which enables us um, on the back end to query the, the data. Um, we provide tools for uh, uh, caching that data, and then we, we use tools like GraphQL um, and UIs to be able to look at that data um, as a graph uh, of uh, interconnected uh, transactions. <clears throat> 
So just to kind of touch on that a little bit more. So the graph um, represents uh, assets, which are basically the nouns of business process. So that could be you know, a bag of coffee, uh, an example later, and transition would be the verb. So the relationships on, and how the, the asset transitions through, the, through its lifetime. Um, and it's specified in the, the actual smart contract. So you have a, a record, the smart contracts become a little bit smarter because they now understand what the data is and how it relates to each other, uh, which can be used in the back end. And we also um, um, use this methodology to kind of extend out to uh, connect. We can connect different versions of smart contracts. So query in the latest version of a smart contract will result in all previous versions being queried also. And we can also connect two different blockchains together using the same uh, graph approach. Um, and we've done that recently for the DOD connecting Quorum and the Hyperledger fabric together in one single query. On the right hand side here, this, this uh, screenshot shows our graph tool. And essentially, you, you have these relationships um, rendered as a graph and you just click on the parts of the graph that you want to search. And then on the right, um, you choose what uh, parameters you want to bring back and, and you can apply filters. Um, for designing smart contracts, we also use this model to enable people to you know, build out smart contracts without writing code. Um, so it kind of creates a boilerplate for these. And it could be the smart contract in total if, if you just do an asset tracking. So this is an additive manufacturing use case where an additive manufacturing component relies as a relationship with an STL file or design. Um, and then the component, once it's manufactured, uh, goes through different transitions. So delivered somewhere, received and installed. Um, each of these boxes you can double click on and, and uh, choose different parameters. Um, uh, well, add different parameters with types and so forth. And you can also add off chain storage to bind it to uh, other file systems. Um, and then that automatically ge generates the solidity um, to uh, deploy on the blockchain. And then taking that, um, using the, the tool, you can take the, the smart contract, choose the blockchain. We support like eight different blockchains now at um, SimbaChain. Um, from uh, ranging from Ethereum, uh, Binance, Avalanche, and right through to Stellar, which is orthogonal in, in its approach also. So you should select the type of blockchain, the actual network. Um, in this case, it's Circle of Life, our network. We, um, you choose a file uh, system if you're using off-chain data. So in this case, I've chosen IPFS. We support several file systems also. And then you choose the smart contract. This is a uh, container demo, which uh, um, I've chosen in this example. Uh, click continue and then choose the name for the URL. And what happens then is we get a, uh, a an API generated for the smart contract. And these consist of get and post methods. Uh, the post allows you to put a transaction uh, and also uh, you can attach files to that transaction also. Um, and that results in a uh, transaction on blockchain um, and a get would be a query. And there's get endpoints for uh, you know query an individual uh, um, transactions of a type that have been put on by that particular method, for example, or there's also the graph query and mechanism as well that can search all the relationships. Um, so this is, uh, I won't go into this much because we, we don't have much time, but this is the uh, SimbaChain enterprise platform and the different components involved in it. So aside from the model, um, uh, we also have auth, so it's designed to be sort of enterprise grade. So we have bindings to, you know, Active Directory, for example, for authentication. Um, we're, we're working with uh, customers like Boeing and so forth, and they have, you know, <laughs> models like that just to even access kind of the platform. Uh, we also have DOD CAT cards, so people can use their um, American sort of identification in the, in the military to access the system. And then we have a smart contract designer, just so the virtual APIs that are created. And then we have this whole thing around the blockchain that supports um, transaction validation resilience. So we deal with nonces on the input, for example. And then we have a transaction cache, which makes it simpler to search. We also have subscriptions and on off-chain data source. So let me go into this um, uh, use case here a little bit, uh, just to give you a flavor of what you know the types of things we're doing. And we've been working with this uh, our customer now, Tox uh, Restaurant. Uh, Gustavo, the guy in the middle here, has written a book on sustainability. And this, uh, th their journey of Tox is amazing. Um, they have about 230 restaurants across Mexico, and they already have uh, been working with the farmers directly in Tacana, um, a region of Mexico, uh, where all the farms are. They have about 150 farms or so. They've been working with them to reduce the supply chain, and they've basically reduced it to what I, I show on the right hand side of the screen here. Um, this is us meeting with Gustavo and the CEO and so forth for Tox. But um, 
it, they've already reduced it to kind of basically about four levels and that um, has enabled kind of sustainability to the extent that it quadrupled the income that the farmers now get for their coffee. Um, however, they, they talked to, they had a survey with the um, Mexican public and they, it was around about 75% of the, the, the public wouldn't believe sustainability that if it was written on a packet. So what they wanted to do is use blockchain to absolutely categorically prove that this, um, this, in, this tracking of the, 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 the data is in terms of the coffee is actually coming from the farm and we're tracking it all the way through, right through to their warehouse. So what we've done here is we've built an app um, in Flutter, Google Flutter, which they use at the cooperative. So the, the bags of coffee come in from the farmer, they go into the cooperative. Um, that transaction is created. We create a barcode. Well, it's actually um, a yeah, barcode that's put on the, the bag of coffee. And then that goes to the de-sheller. The de-sheller takes the, the shells off the coffee. It comes back from the de-sheller to the cooperative. And then they take it to the roaster. When it gets to the roaster, it goes into, uh, it, it gets roasted for 10 minutes, gets uh, ground, and then it gets um, uh, sent to the, the this machine that puts it in bags and so forth. <clears throat> and then it goes into the warehouse and then it's distributed to those restaurants. So we've created an app in the yellow parts of this diagram to go all the way to the roaster. And then we also use our generated REST APIs, we were able to integrate with their warehouse management system um, to integrate the tracking within Tokes as well. So it's, it's now tracked right through to the restaurant. Um, and that is, um, you know, this has just been put in production about three months ago. And the restaurants are just about to be starting to open back up. So there's going to be sort of press releases and announcements uh, soon that, that they will start claiming, you know, sustainable coffee and give proof to the customers that they're actually doing that uh, with this blockchain solution. It also kind of eliminates counterfeits. So that's kind of all I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, you know, Simple Chain is about uh, two years long. We found it in uh, actually three years now. So 2017, we found it. Uh, we won some awards in the, uh, the top pick and disrupt um, a couple of years ago and, and, uh, and so forth. We also won an additive manufacturing challenge beating um, uh, Boeing and, uh, and um, Stratasys in the final of that, which was very interesting um, for you know, providing a blockchain solution for additive manufacturing and recently the Tibbetts Award, uh, which is basically um, Hall of Fame of Government Contract in America. And, and we're just about to sort of kind of expand you know, on the commercial offerings with Tokes being one of those. So, okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so it's great, and I hope you will be able to catch your flight. Uh, if there are any yeah. questions, uh, so please uh, type them in uh, from the audience. Uh, the records uh, of the session will stay, uh, I mean, um, available after the session. So there will be uh, a possibility for all of you to direct people to to see and three wise. Uh, parts of uh, what has been said today. So thanks again.